Hi friends, welcome to the Share, Invite, Proclaim channel. My name is Judy. We're in a series of, uh, of the, uh, of Revelation. Uh, not studied Revelation in detail much, and it's time. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, in the last uh, couple weeks, I've done uh, the message to Ephesus and the message to Smyrna, and today I do the the uh, letter to uh, Pergamon. And again, I, <clears throat> as geography, I always like to know where these places are in the world. We're in Turkey. So we started in Ephesus. And right now we're going up here to Pernicum. In Western Turkey. <clears throat> and let me remind you that John is on the island of Patmos in a penal colony. And uh, he's there because of his faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and again, I think that uh, <clears throat> John was able to write a letter to each of these um, to each of these uh, churches, rather than an extended letter that uh, would be a circular letter that would be to uh, all of them. I think that each of the churches had specific uh, things that um, the Lord wanted uh, to be communicated. So the letter to Pernicum is uh, Pergamon, Pergamon, Revelation 2, uh, 13 through 17. Now, let me say at the, the beginning, those of you who uh, have listened to any of my, uh, any of my uh, messages, I have difficulty pronouncing a lot of these things, biblical things. Um, and this one is a big one because it deals with a lot of Greek words. So, telling you in advance. Well, Pergamon is a political, religious, and cultural city. It's 55 miles north of Ephesus. Um, and it was the capital of the province until AD 130 when Alexander the Great invaded. Um, and Pergamon is second only to Alexandria's library. Pergamus had 200,000 books with every book written by hand and every uh, book copied by hand. It was a famous religious center. You had the altar of Zeus, the god of Mount Olympus. You had the temple of Dionysus, Dianus, uh, uh, the god of wine and pleasure. You had the temple of uh, Demeter, uh, the god of food or the goddess of food. You had the temple of Athena, the god of wisdom, a goddess of wisdom. You had the temple of Caesar Augustus, and um, you had to believe that Caesar is Lord and that Caesar would grant safety and peace to the empire citizens. Then you had the temple of Asclepios, Alep, the god of healing. And this emblem was the serpent. Sufferers from uh, all over would come to this temple and spend the night. The, the uh, theory went that if you were, if, if a tame snake uh, touched you, it was the touch of God and that you would be healed. Or the cure would be told you. The medical field used this snake around a pole because of healing. So Pergamon was a city where the anti-God forces were supported by Satan. Now, <clears throat> Joe St uh, Stowell, uh, president of Cornerstone University, has a great series on these letters. And he said, it's it was a challenge 24-7, 365 days a year for, for a Christian to live in this city. Note the differences between the pagan and the Christian views. Jesus is king of kings, not Zeus. 
Jesus gives us abundant life, not uh, Dion, Dionysus, Dionysus. Jesus fed the 5,000, not Demeter. Jesus did miracles of healing, not Ashlopius. Jesus has the, all the treasures of wisdom, not Athena. And Jesus is the giver of eternal life, not the empire. I thought that was rather good uh, comparison. Well, here we have the words of greeting to the pastor of Pergamum. Uh, and then words from the son of man, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now, Pergamon was called the city of the sword because uh, the local senate had the authority to give a death sentence. And so the message here is that the sword of Jesus is superior because it's a two-edged sword. Words of praise. I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. And you, Pergamon, hold fast my name. And you, the church, you do not deny faith in me even in the days of Antipas. Antipas was a bishop of the Christian church and martyred probably by Caesar Dominican in AD 92. There's a couple views uh, depending upon who you read on how he died. One says he was boiled alive in hot oil in the city square. Another one says he was killed by a sword. And a third one says that he was roasted to death inside a bull. He had it a severe death. Jesus said of Antipas that he is my witness, my faithful one. <clears throat> then he says, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is, where Antipas was martyred. Christians have to continue living there. They cannot leave and go to a place where being a Christian is safer. Well, you know, in modern days, missionaries have... Uh, gone to very dangerous places to serve, and they stay there because they know that's where God sent them. Words of weakness to the church at Pergamum. You tolerate those who hold to the teaching of Balaam. And this is a reference to Numbers 22. Uh, Balak hired him. Um, Balaam was a pagan prophet. He hired him to put a curse on the Israelites. Balak was a, a, um, a king um, of the Moabites. And when, the, when Israel uh, left uh, Egypt, um, they asked the Moabites for food and water, and, and they were denied. Uh, Balak hired Balaam to curse Israel, and it was believed that whomever Balaam uh, cursed would be cursed, and whoever he blessed would be blessed. Words of weakness. The church tolerated those who taught the teaching of Balaam, which was to worship idols by participating in the worship feasts, uh, sacrifices made to idols. Also, the teaching of Balaam encouraged acts of immorality, sexual relationships outside marriage, fornication. Balaam was a, a prophet, a pagan prophet from a Pithor, a city on the Euphrates River. And Balaam was hired by Balak to curse the Israelites, but God had him bless Israel. Now, some Christians at Pergamum wanted to compromise. You know, compromise is uh, is uh, big. They wanted to participate in the pagan temples and in the Christian church. Jesus taught that he was the way. You couldn't worship in both worlds. You had to make a choice. In addition to the teachings of Balaam, uh, some of the Christian church practiced the teachings of the Na uh, Nicolaitans, the Nicolaitans believed that what you did in your body didn't matter, that your soul would go to heaven, uh, and you could eat meat offered to idols and participate in the worship of Artemis and Caesar's statue and, and, um, and participate in acts of immorality, but their souls would go to heaven. And here are the words of warning. Repent. Feel regret and turn from your sin in thoughts and actions, or else I'm coming to you 
quickly and I will war against these false teachers and teachings. I will come with the sword of my mouth, that two-edged sword. The false people will be slain with Christ's two-edged sword. Christ will come quickly because the damage that false teachers have impacts and spreads inside the church. Satan blinds the eyes of those who accept the false teaching and drives out the truth of the gospel. And so Pergamon was pretty good about avoiding the worship of, um, say, the emperor, but they had some issues inside the church of allowing false teachings uh, to occur. So the message to them was to repent. And then the reward for those in Pergamum says Christ gives some hidden manna, a white stone, and a new name written on the stone. Now, this hidden mat manna, there's some differences in the interpretations. Dr. Blevins says it's the word of God, and I, I tend to agree with that. Barclay says that those who refuse to eat the meat offered to idols, they would receive the bread of God. And really, I think that's the same as the word of God. Uh, De Santos, another scholar, says it's a symbol of the promised blessings that the believer receives at the second coming of Christ. And Fred Howard, another um, scholar, says it's spiritual food. I go along with Dr. Blevins. It's the word of God. Hidden manna. The white stone. Well, we find out from our scholars that, that uh, a white stone was given to a person who had been tried in a court of law and was acquitted. And much of, especially Paul's writings, he talks about, he, he uses language of, of um, judgment and law. A white stone was given to a person who was freed from slavery. And, and I suppose you could say that, that uh, belief in Christ freed you from the slavery of sin and death and the, the slave to uh, a, Jude, uh, a Jewish system. It, the white stone is presented to a winner of athletic events. It's presented to a warrior returning victoriously from war. Um, it's worn as a charm or an amulet to keep the person safe. It's related to the stones on the breastplate of the high priest. Uh, Barclay says that uh, white stones were used in counting for calculations. And it was like a free ticket to um, gladiatorial games, free food and admission. Uh, but I, I still go back that, that the white stone was given to a person who had been uh, tried in a court of law and was acquitted. The new name written on the stone. I, I agree with Howard that the new name written on the stone revealed the new character that the person had once they had become a believer. In the Old Testament, sort of like Jacob, was changed, his name was changed to Israel. But I believe that it could be some name like redeemed or saved or Jesus is Lord or new life. Something that would reflect the change in the person's heart. That's just my opinion. And then we have the choir that sings, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So if this were a play <clears throat> in Ephesus, telling the uh, first century believers um, encouragement, Pergamum would be this third window that a picture would be put up upon where they would see the city of Pergamon. And in the theater, it would be across here, and John would be standing over here uh, giving the message to these churches. And here's the, I'm sorry, the 24 elders, and Christ is in the center. So Pergamon. Well, here's some thought questions. 
What little sins do we tend to allow into our lifestyle and habits that need to be confessed and repented of? What's the best way to deal with Christians who circulate unbiblical ideas? What sins do we tend to tolerate in our own lives or in the lives of our Christian friends when we should not? What dangers do we face when we refuse to respond to God or to repent of our sins? When others mislead us, what can we do to correct our mistakes? What have you been tolerating in your life that you need to reject and change? Some good thought questions. Um, so this is the letter that John wrote to Pergamon. And uh, we'll, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we will uh, follow up with the next letter to uh, Thyatira. And uh, I hope that these are helping you um, and that uh, they are thought provoking. Uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.